All right, let's go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Wonky Angle, where I talk about electronic music, both new and old. And today, it is time for Some Stuff I Missed, in which I go down some stuff I missed. Not all the stuff I missed, but some stuff I missed. All right, here we go, doing another one of these. Uh, given how completely out of control the last volume got, I figured I need to pare these roundups down a little to a somewhat more manageable length. And so now instead of 30, we have just 18 releases on the docket. All stuff from this first leg of 2021, aside from one project that slipped through the cracks from the from the end of last year. Going through them as briefly as I see fit, and probably not briefly enough. I mean, uh, this is gonna be another ridiculously long video either way, but at least it won't be two hours this time. Trying to be careful in the future not to let these things get uh, that big again, but at the very least, I think, uh, I think I'll actually be able to fit all the favorite and least favorite tracks in the video description again. There are some other 2021 projects that I've come across that I might be interested in covering in another volume later in the year, but I figured I should err on the side of cutting this video off earlier for the sake of not burning myself out. So yeah, let's not waste any more time. Let's just get right into it. Starting off with Mossy Projects, Volume 1, Side A and B. Alright, we're starting off with this side collab thing from Michael Mennert and James 2 aka Trophy Beats. Technically two separate EPs with uh, Volume 1 Side A and Side B having their own uh, respective pages on Bandcamp. Gonna have to link both. But these two seven track EPs are pretty clearly meant to be listened to like one after the other as a single 14 track album. Slightly confusing, but whatever. This is a very nice and chilled out collection of summery atmospheric hip hop beats. All these tracks flow together quite seamlessly and build up this very blissful and nostalgic vibe, creating an impressive sense of open space. And I think it needs to be made clear, even though I barely feel like I have anything to say about these and do not particularly feel like breaking them down, let it be known that I think this pair of projects is great. And I've already come back to it more than I expected over the course of the past few months. I get the feeling that they intended this stuff to work best while smoking weed, at least I can guess that based on the fact that both EPs have a track labeled as a weed farm type beat, side B having one called 10,000 Blunts, or all the samples throughout this project talking about blunts or coming from stoners, or just the fact that the band name is Mossy Projects. <laughs> I don't smoke myself and obviously had no trouble getting into this project without weed, but I can assume that would be a nice addition to the experience for anyone who does. <laughs> But yeah, like, getting into the hazy atmosphere of tracks like Dopesters and All Day Early and Till the End is already lovely, especially as you get, like, some jazzy, reverb-y horn solos on the latter two tracks. But I wouldn't even consider these major favorites compared to some of these more, like, soul sample-driven tracks like Citroen and Last Summer, which have a lot more heart and emotion put into them. Just hearing all these sounds meld together makes for that perfect kind of nostalgic gut punch. Also love the almost vaporwave-esque tones of a track like Stone Glance and its saxophone loops, or the fuzzy cloud of melody on Weed Farm type beat number two, or the stranger and more unpredictable excursions of 10,000 Blunts. This is not the kind of project that merits brain usage or any kind of in-depth analysis. It is just purely excellent vibing music, intended for easing all the various anxieties brought on by the crazy world we live in. And it really hits the spot so damn well, especially uh, if it's like a hot day when I'm tired and don't feel like thinking about stuff. I have a feeling it's gonna get even more listening rotation this coming summer. Not that this is much of a surprise from our project attached to Michael Mender, it really can't go wrong with that guy when it comes to this kind of material. But even then, I did end up getting more out of this than I typically do out of his side projects. It's probably the most replayable project with his name attached since From the Sea. As low stakes and simple as it is, this has only been growing on me more and more with every successive listen. I can fully co-sign every bit of it. On both EPs together, I'm overall feeling an 8.3 out of 10. Next up from Bicep, Isles. Alright then, Bicep, another one of those outfits that this roundup format was kind of designed for. Long ago, I covered their self-titled debut album, did a proper video on it and everything. And while I liked the project fine enough, I also knew right away that it wasn't going to stick with me longer term, and I even said as much in the video. 
And yeah, I've not listened to that album since or even really thought about it since. But when I heard that they were going to be following it up and I got a few requests to cover it, I eh, threw it in here, figuring I was basically just going to get some pleasant IDM or tech house type background music and not much else that would give me much of anything to say. And yeah, I can pretty much confirm the general hype I've been seeing from fellow reviewers that this is in fact an album that exists. It has beats. It has melodies. It has a guest singer that sounds like Kelly Lee Owens, but isn't. Okay, well, in all seriousness, while this once again isn't going to be anything I keep around longer term, and there isn't a single sound or texture on this album that I haven't already heard before on dozens upon dozens of other projects in this genre, I did find this to be a more engaging listening experience than I expected. These tracks do generally have the right amount of energy and drive you'd want out of this kind of music. Even felt like they had some emotion behind them. I can see the appeal as, like, another sort of... Uh, turn Your Brain Off album, and it could all go down pretty well in a live setting. I thought Atlas was a surprisingly solid opener with all its brighter melodies. I thought Lido was a nice little lower-key piano-driven moment. I liked all the more varied, skittery textures of X and the banging acoustic drum loop of Sundial. But I also didn't really get pulled in by much more beyond that. I know Apricots was a favorite of many people, but that one just washed right over me. And even in spite of these tracks trying to sound sorta epic through their melodies, by the last two tracks I was just, like, flat out almost falling asleep. I'll give it credit, I went into this expecting a run-of-the-mill snooze fest from start to finish, and while it was, in fact, more plain-sounding than even what I remembered of their self-titled, I'm at least glad I got a decent handful of tracks that could hit pretty effectively for me in the particular lane they were going for. It's not bad at all, you could do a lot worse than this, but you know, it's still not exactly the most colorful or exciting house album I've ever heard either, so... Yeah, this is like a 6.5 out of 10, I guess. Next up from Frontline Assembly, Mechanical Soul. <laughs> Alright, new album from Industrial Legends Frontline Assembly. Since I reviewed their Wake Up the Coma album back in 2019 and generally thought they were pretty cool, had a lot of solid albums in their lengthy catalog, I figured I may as well give this a shot as well. The buzz surrounding this one was that it was pretty much exactly what you would expect from them at this point, and yeah, I can confirm that. It's definitely a Frontline Assembly album. Same old EBM and electro-industrial grooves you're used to, same whisper-shout vocals from Bill Lieb, same mishmash of edginess and dystopian science fiction themes in the lyrics, with the occasional questionable line like, I'm driving naked in my car. All that aside, while there's pretty much nothing in the way of surprises here, I did generally enjoy myself with this thing all the way through. The production is really solid across the board, carried most of these tracks on their own. I thought the tracks Glass and Leather and Unknown might have actually bordered on great. I really got into how nasty and propulsive the grooves of the former were, and the slightly spacey edge to the latter. Both of them were a ton of fun. I thought Alone was also a pretty solid cut in how creepy and sour and menacing everything sounded. New World was a neat surprise in how it surprisingly had like a lighter and more agreeable tone to it, at least comparatively. Even starting out with some IDM melodies in a major key. And Combs Dirpt Meet Mir <laughs> had uh, some really good bass lines too. Tracks like these may be predictable for them, but uh, they still really hit in the way I would hope. And there weren't really any outright clunkers here. I guess the album doesn't start or end particularly strong with Purge and Time Lapse. Both of those cuts were pretty forgettable. And I guess my least favorite was Barbarian, since I wasn't a fan of the guest appearance from that guy from Front 242. Already distinctly remember not liking their track Future Fail, which this was a remake of, uh, specifically because I found that guy's voice to be ridiculous and sound like a pirate or something. But I wasn't as bothered by him on this retooling either. Maybe because the instrumental was better and more detailed? Or maybe he didn't ham it up as much this time? I don't know what changed, but I don't know, it wasn't too bad. But that's about it. While this album isn't gonna surprise any longtime fans, I did all around have fun with it. The standouts like Glass and Leather and Unknown make it worth the price of admission. Nothing else felt offensive or below average for them, and I think I do think I can confidently say I I enjoyed this more than Wake Up the Coma. That was an album I remember most for its bizarre missteps than for the moments I actually liked. And this, while probably not going to stick in my mind nearly as much, did leave me off more positively on average. So take that all as you will. I think I'll let this get away with a solid 7 out of 10. Next up from Ochre, An Eye to Windward.
Okay, Ochre, that's Christopher Leary, an IDM artist who's been at it since the mid-early 2000s. A while back I highlighted his debut album, A Midsummer Nice Dream, in my video on 40 more greatest electronic albums of all time. And I'd even planned to review his last album, Project Kalos, around the time it came out in 2018, but it fell through the cracks since I remember being somewhat disinterested with some of the projects he put out after his debut. Thought this segment would make for a good opportunity to catch myself back up with his catalog and form some more concrete opinions on his stuff beyond that first album. Always thought he was a pretty overlooked artist in general. So here's some really quick thoughts on his previous catalog. Yeah, this one's already stuck with me long term, takes a lot of typical IDM tones and turns them into this enjoyably saccharine and nostalgic blend that falls somewhere between early metamatics and old rich now. Lots of excellent melodies here, essential listening for any IDM fans. Basically the debut again, but with more violins and less consistency. I remember not particularly caring for this one before, but it did hold up better than I expected coming back to it, at least at a handful of really solid standouts. Like the last album, but with even more varied instrumentation and also significantly better. Like, I really slept on this one, this was great. This is a total dead ringer for Plaid from front to back, and that's not even Bennett Walsh's fault. Like the last album, but longer and with less sonic variety, and also better somehow? Hey, the orchestral elements are back, and lots of beatless transage cuts all over this one too. Really dang solid, might have slipped on this one as well. Okay, so yeah, this guy's first album is still my favorite, and his other stuff can be a little hit and miss, but good to know that he did in fact have other solid material in him aside from that, which I might want to keep around. Now, that brings us to this latest album here, An Eye to Windward, which I think is his first project to be entirely ambient from front to back. Not a single drum beat to be found anywhere, all just letting its melodic synths do the work and create their own soundscapes. It's certainly a neat point of interest in his catalog, maybe even more surprising that it took him this long to do a project like this, given how long these influences have been present in his style. But is it one of said keepers? No, definitely not. I mean, it's all fine enough for what it is, but I'm not gonna act like any of this reads to me as anything special in the grander scheme of the genre. Honestly, kinda highlights what I feel to be some of Ochre's biggest weaknesses. This guy, at his best, can put out wholly unique IDM and ambient experiences with lots of beautiful melodies or even better developed instrumental textures, but at his worst, he can feel derivative and lacking in personality. And An Eye to Windward is unfortunately one such example of the latter. Heck, if I'm being honest, it's probably my least favorite project from him to date. And that honor was previously held by National Ignition, since it read to me as a really blatant plaid ripoff. But I mean, if you're gonna wholesale copy someone like that, you may as well copy one of the most unique outfits in electronic music. And Ochre was already sonically close enough to their style that he could convincingly nail their sound. Had it come from plaid themselves, I wouldn't have blinked or even found it to be a lesser entrant in their catalog. This project, though, I mean, it's not bad, but it mostly just re kind of reads to me as very formless and bland. Just a selection of meandering, tangerine, dream-ish ambient compositions that certainly make sense coming from Ochre and can fit in his usual style, but none of which really stick out to me as being all that interesting. Not to say it's totally lacking in engaging material. I suppose the slow, beatless trance of a track like Rising Tide was kind of nice, gave me a bit of, like, Barker utility vibes. Uh, the synth progressions of Socotra were pretty cool, nicely layered. Starshade had a few piano sounds in the beginning to accentuate its monolithic pads. Perenherm was basically a more emotionally resonant continuation of that track. A Current Undersea was basically a more emotionally resonant continuation of both of those tracks. Probably the best track in the bunch. And Fiddlehead had a lot of cool bell noises. It can certainly all get the job done for what it is. Even a track like Evacuation, which reminds me of some of my least favorite cuts on Aphex Twin Selected Ambient Works Volume 2, like Domino, that one did still feel heartfelt enough to stick the landing. But still, it's hard to get excited about any of this when I already know well that heartfelt melodies have been Ochre's main draw since the beginning. He can deliver great melodies in his sleep, and all his other albums are just as good in that department if not significantly better. This project, it's perfectly inoffensive, it's serviceable for what it is. I can't imagine it'll be an outright turnoff to anyone coming across Ochre's music in passing, but I don't think it's gonna, like, stop anyone in their tracks either. He's proven to be capable of much better than this, and I don't think it's gonna resonate that strongly beyond his diehard fans. Feeling like a 6.3 out of 10 on this. But hey, if you want some low-key ambient IDM material with a bit more personality... Next up, from Shy to Where Wings Rust. Shai is an artist from the Speak and Spell Records roster who I have covered before. Uh, last year she came out with a little five-track album called Obscura that I thought was quite nice. 
and had me coming back to it quite a bit over the course of the year, frequently enough to the point that I even decided to mark it as an honorable mention for my favorite albums of 2020 overall. So when I saw that she put out this project, which had a slightly meatier track listing at 8 tracks and being advertised as a small step to expand her sound in an attempt at something a bit larger scale and more striking, focusing more on the idea of escapism than before, I was pretty hyped to get into it and was even kind of hoping that I'd have enough to say for a proper video this time. And obviously that did not happen, and I did not enjoy this more than Obscura, but I did think it was quite solid. It did take a bit to really get going for me. At first I just started to feel like deja vu with the opening stretch, which mostly stuck to similar mixes of sounds to her last project. Clockwork had some nice melodies, Cyrus Cove was basically a copy of the opener, it was pretty cool too, and Reincarnate did stick out to me for having a much glitchier and more cerebral mix than the sound I'd heard her explore before. It was all very nice for what it was, but I wouldn't say any of it was really sweeping me off my feet. But the moment at which this album really gets going for me is Gate, which was a strange swerve into all these odd, warped, experimental synth effects. It was really different from any of the other material I'd heard from her and had me much more intrigued for what I was getting. And while it is probably the most interesting and striking moment here, the rest of the album did generally keep my attention on a similar level. I really liked the warmer and more heartfelt piano lines of Heart of Mechana, and the way they made an interesting contrast with some of the glitchier experimentations behind them. It was the one moment here that probably most effectively had me emotionally invested, and the way a lot of these same sounds seemed to disintegrate and tumble apart into a glittering heap on following track Prismatic Ghosts was quite compelling as well. And the buzzing synth bass on Hurried Float and Dewdrops really let that track stand out from the crowd. The way its melodies developed seemed quite complex and odd in a way that felt more intentionally crafted than other moments on here, and I was pretty well pulled into that one as well. Not that the other stuff on this project didn't feel intentionally crafted, just, you know, the rest of this thing generally tends to have more of a free-flowing, almost improvisational flair to it by my ears. Like on the final track, Quiet, which mostly just kind of meandered around and stood out for being the least structured track on this album, which already doesn't concern itself with structuring all that much. But there is certainly a nice mood created by it that's both tranquil and unsettling and that can kind of need in that way. As a whole, while this did not hit the same emotional note for me that Obscura did, and I don't think it's going to end up supplanting that project in any way, this was certainly a grower for me over time. It does different enough things so as not to step on Obscura's toes. I do really like that she is attempting to evolve her sound into new territory, and that the particular execution across the board is still really easily recognizable as her own and no one else's. So yeah, this was quite nice, definitely worth giving a shot. I'll give it a 7.5 out of 10. Next up from Chicane, Everything We Had To Leave Behind. Chicane is a commercial trance artist who I've covered once before on this channel. Back in 2018, I did a video on his last album, The Place You Can't Remember, The Place You Can't Forget, complete with full and brief segments. Though, gonna be honest, after doing that video, I don't think I would have expected to actually be interested enough to check out another new project of his. While I like this guy's first two albums, for being in the same vein as like those mid-90s progressive trance projects like BT's Ima and ESEM, and he's had his fair share of solid tracks here and there in the following years, He's also been pretty inconsistent since, and I thought his last two albums especially were really boring and generic. I wouldn't have even thought to bother with this until I saw one of my regular commenters said that this was his favorite album of the year so far, and possibly even a future classic. And that is a bold statement to apply to a new Chicane album of all things. I had no expectations for this myself, but I figured I may as well give it a shot out of morbid curiosity. And after listening to it, um, while I definitely would not go as far as to call it a future classic, not only is it his most straightforward trans-centric album in many years, it's one of his best in a long time as well. At least his best in Somersault, or maybe even his best since Behind the Sun. Well, I haven't closely listened to any of his projects since actually making that video on him three years ago, so you can take that with a grain of salt, but it is a remarkably solid comeback for him. Any commercial trance fans who thought he'd lost it like I did really ought to give this one a shot. I mean, it doesn't exactly show him doing anything new you wouldn't already expect from him, just sticking to the light melodic trance formulas he's best known for. But unlike the place you can't remember where he stuck to his usual formulas and came out with a bunch of mid, this album executes those formulas a lot better. It can be enjoyed on the same level as a good Solar Stone record. Good trance grooves, good melodies, 
don't really need much more than that, and he nails pretty much all of it. There are a lot of tracks on here with uncredited vocals from some guy, might be Chicane himself? Uh, seemingly trying to deliver a similar sort of airy performance that Brian Adams could add to Don't Give Up, and he's not too bad. Can get tracks like Eight Circle, or Sailing, or Don't Look Down to work pretty well, all really solid tunes. My favorite cuts on here, though, tend to be the much more straightforward trance and house cuts like Never Look Back, or Juno, or Hello Goodbye, or One Foot in the Past, One Foot in the Future. Uh, they just have really good grooves and melodic progressions to them, especially the latter of those. The melodies on that one were properly great. Also found the female vocal hook on Now or Never to be especially sticky, and I wish it had lasted longer. That one was excellent. Also love the chopped up choir sounds on the track Capricorn. That might be my favorite track here. I don't know if this album is gonna, like, stick with me longer term or anything, it is still rather formulaic, and there's a part of me who wished it was even punchier than it is, let these tracks run on longer, get better space to breathe, but it's surprisingly consistent, all things considered. Closest thing it had to a dud was An Ocean Apart, that track kinda felt like filler, and the singer sounded like a low-end Chris Martin from Coldplay. Also wasn't really a fan of the tune on Make You Stay, thought it's more breakbeat-focused backpedal breaks remix was better. But that's two weak cuts out of 14. Everything else was at least good to great. All the other tracks felt like something that Chicane legit had his heart put into and could be single material in their own right. Fitting for how 8 of the 14 tracks on here were apparently released as pre-album singles. I wouldn't go in expecting to have your mind blown or anything, but it is definitely worth a shot for anyone into this kind of commercial trance. Certainly way surpassed my own expectations. I'll give it a 7.5 out of 10. Next up from Kessler, Ambivalent EP. Alright, now here's one that's gotten quite a bit of buzz around the reviewers I follow. Uh, Kessler is a British drum and bass producer, and this six-track EP has really made the rounds. I've been recommended it multiple times. I've seen a lot of burial comparisons being made here, though aside from the track Old Wives' Tale, which is practically a dead ringer for the guy, the way he combined that trademark banging but atmospheric UK garage sound with much faster paced drum and bass grooves and break beats instead reminded me more of uh, Machine Drum's Vapor City. And in either case, I will not complain too much. I am all for more material like that in the world. And every track on this EP provides at least something for me to enjoy. If the worst parts are Old Wives' Tale for being a bit too obvious about its main influence, uh, Kwaku for being oddly forgettable despite banging among the hardest of the tracks on here, and still making for a relatively climactic closer, or Lambert Rise for feeling kind of thin and underdeveloped despite still having a sticky lead melody I quite like. I think if those tracks are the low lights, that's probably a good sign. And the best moments could even border on properly great. I really liked the soul sample flipping of Moonlight Branches and how they crash into the airy synths and Amen Breaks, the synth washes of Vrealis, Vrisalon. <laughs> uh, that, that reminded me of uh, Ski Mask's Flyby VFR in the best way. And penultimate track Only a Fool has some really epic progressions to it in the way it slowly evolves from giant ambient pads and violin solos into banging beat focus sections and gets it all to work together seamlessly. Now there is one little issue that prevents me from getting as excited about this project as I think most people seem to have been and it's the fact that I think it's a bit too long-winded. There may only be six tracks on here, but this EP is 40 minutes long. Enough to call a proper album if you so wanted to. And aside from Only a Fool, most of these tracks stick to the same kinds of sounds throughout their full running time and don't really progress that much. Which leads to them often seeming to just like run on and on. I find myself losing interest a bit over time. See, so yeah, I guess I only like this project despite wanting to love it. I don't think it's a longer term keeper for me, but I do still find it quite promising, especially coming from an artist who hasn't been around that long or has much to his name yet. And I will not deny the best moments on here are something special. So yeah, even if I wish I was hotter on it, I think I'm in the minority of people who don't love it. I still definitely found enough to like here to co-sign it. Worth a shot for anyone interested. I'll give it a 7.3 out of 10. Next up from Yu Su, Yellow River Blue. Alright, speaking of projects which have been getting some buzz around my general reviewer circles, 
Uh, this is an ambient dub project, the debut from this artist originally from China but currently living in Canada. Apparently he used to be one half of a band called Your Me that had one album in 2016, but for the most part it feels like he basically just popped onto the scene totally out of nowhere on the merits of this album here. And, you know, just based on how unique it is, both from her actual background and the way it actually sounds, I can kind of see why it's been getting as much attention as it has. The influences she draws upon go beyond just ambient and dub, which I was already intrigued by given my longtime Orb fandom. And yes, it is the same kind of dub they do. But she also takes a lot of cues from minimal techno and krautrock trying to create these wildly varied electronic soundscapes inspired by her own tour through mainland China and the landscapes she saw. And these tracks can get fairly strange sounding, but it's a lot more stripped back and simplistic in its sound design than I had expected it to be. Had to listen to it a couple of times to like recalibrate my thoughts. It's the kind of thing where I feel like I enjoy it most if I approach it the same way I would a minimal techno record. Even if that's not necessarily what it's going for stylistically, it is very much produced like a project in that genre with how clean and pristine every sound is, almost to the point of feeling synthetic or sterile. Well, emphasis on almost, she does still manage to capture a more organic warmth with these sounds that you won't get out of most minimal techno projects. But it was an odd mix that sort of threw me off on my first listen. Not to mention, as odd a mix of styles as she draws from, she doesn't always, like, put them together at once. The eight tracks on here are very stylistically disconnected from each other and don't really seem to come together in a greater whole. While there's no tracks I outright dislike, uh, some could definitely hit more for me than others. Like, Futuro had a really good bass line and the groove it created hit just that right mark for me that similar early Orb tracks could, though it also felt a bit thin and underdeveloped. Touch Me Not had a lot of pretty bell synths cascading over each other, but didn't have much to offer outside of that. Uh, the minimal Tech House beat of Gleam was nice enough for what it was, but also completely disappears from my head the second it's done. But the creepy experimental trippiness of Klein was a lot of fun, combining its absolutely slamming drum beats with lots of squeaking 70s krautrock synth textures and echoing voices in the background. The minimal blips and pads of Dusty going up against some more shuffling percussion textures created a nice low-key subtle mood and quite a few interesting evolutions over time. And of course, the more energetic and melody center cuts like Shu and Meliuka, uh, Mel Melaluka. Those tracks were a ton of fun, uh, and created just like this bright and uplifting energy that was super infectious. And the latter track's Night Counterpart was similarly striking in a more chill and laid back way. Those three tracks were unsurprisingly my favorites here. While this project did kind of throw me off at first, I do certainly have to give it credit for sticking out from the crowd and being a grower with repeat listens. Only time will tell how much this is going to get replay value-wise in the coming months or whether it ends up growing on me even more, but I think I can co-sign this on the level that most of my peers have. I'll give it like, I'll give it a 7.3 out of 10. Next up from Flux Pavilion, Dot Wave. Man, seeing this guy again really took me back. Maybe not the kind of thing you'd expect me to cover, but I've actually had a longer history with Flex Pavilion than you'd expect. Back in my high school days when I was at the peak of my, like, EDM modern dubstep phase, I remember very briefly getting into his 2013 EP, Blow the Roof, and revisiting it all these years later, it may not surprise you to hear that the production on that thing is not very good by today's standards. Back in the day, the thing that specifically set himself apart from the crowd was the fact that he swamped all his mixes in even more sub-bass than, than anyone else. Th that was his actual selling point for some reason, if I recall correctly. <laughs> but I don't know, maybe it's just a nostalgia talk, and I thought that EP still held up all right, thing all things considered. Still had its share of tracks like the title track and Do or Die with Childish Gambino that still slap, among others. Also, I remembered his 2015 debut album, uh, Tesla. If I had started up this review channel a few months earlier than I did, that could have been one of the first videos I ever did here but it slid through the cracks, I kind of forgot it existed by the time I'd gotten started making videos. Though you might be surprised to hear that Tesla actually holds up a lot better than Blow the Roof coming back to it. There was a slight pivot towards, you know, some electro pop among a few other various genre experiments while still combining everything with the old modern dubstep and electro house styles that he came up in, and he figured out that actually making good tracks is probably more desirable than making intentionally brutal listening experiences. Kicked just as much ass as my favorite stuff in this genre can without being nearly as ear-destroying or letting the bass actively swamp out the rest of the mixes. It was a lot of fun. If you're like a fan of 
uh, say, Feed Me's Calamari Tuesday and that whole era of EDM, then it's still definitely worth a shot if you missed it. Now, I was definitely curious as to what a new album from this guy in 2021 might sound like, especially with features from Feed Me and What's So Not and Chime, among a, like a dozen others. I'd planned on doing a proper video on it, but after putting off checking it out for too long after it'd be relevant, I just threw it on here instead. Also ended up here because, disappointingly, this album turned out to not be nearly as interesting as I'd hoped. I mean, it's not badly produced or anything, but that's like an outright turnoff. I suppose Flex Pavilion has updated his sound to fit better in the EDM scene going on right now, so more influences from artists like Flume and Odessa and Millennium and all those. The latter of those especially. Great, all my favorites. <laughs> and he does focus a lot on these like, thin, sorta organ-like synth leads that are more of a product of the EDM scene from eight years ago. He even occasionally leans into the organ-like texture of such leads as seen on a track like Partial Fugue in B Minor, where he attempts to get something like Bach-inspired together. That's definitely a thing that exists. But, uh, yeah, for the most part, even if this album has 16 tracks and so many different guest features, a lot of these tracks sound similar to each other, and a lot of them feature, like, some guest singer that sounds like Lord or Halsey or something. Every track is trying to be all epic and important and meaningful, as has been more the trend in mainstream media in, like, the past five years or so, and it all just runs together. Tesla worked as well as it did for me because it had a lot of variety, and every feature could bring something to the table that none of the others could. And on this one, I just wouldn't be able to tell most of the tracks apart from each other. And that gets especially tiring when I'm not particularly pulled in by the overdramatic core style that Flux Pavilion sticks to here. Not to say it didn't still have its moments, though. Uh, the best track on here was almost certainly Fall to Me with Chime and Space Cadets. That one had, like, some more uplifting energy to it, had all these xylophone sounds in the mix for extra flavor. Probably got a noticeable boost thanks to Landon Remixes having cured it a while before the album dropped. But that track is really good and does have a different enough energy from the rest of the track listing that still left an impact even in the album's greater context. I also really like the track with Feed Me, Survive, had a cutesier flair to it and one of the better tunes behind it as well. I thought the more atmospheric focus of Twitterbird ended up sticking with me better than most of these other tracks as well as its reverby, chopped up Vocaloid sounds. I thought the tune behind I Believe was one of the stickier ones. Uh, Symphony was pretty catchy too, if also very jerky and motion sickness inducing a la Flume skin. Uh, Breathe was a nice little ambient vocal interlude thing, and I suppose I can appreciate how the closer Love tried to its best to be the loudest and most intense track in the bunch to make for some kind of climactic finish, even if its impact is muted by all the other tracks which sound just like it. But that's about all I got. I mean, if you're a fan of, say, Elenium's Ashes, this might end up hitting with you on the same sort of level. It does remind me quite a bit of that project, just sonically, as I mentioned. But I was not a fan of that album either, and more than anything, I just found this to be, a, like, a tedious listen. This did not justify running on for over an hour or having 16 tracks. I guess technically it is more cohesive than Tesla, but I have no idea why you'd want to listen to this over that one. Tesla was just so much more fun and energetic, go listen to that instead. We can make fun of the early 2010 scene of, like, modern dubstep and festival EDM for all the inane and shallow party music that's often loud for its own sake, but I didn't need an album from Flux Pavilion of all people to take itself this seriously or feel this one note. I don't mind him changing and evolving with the times, he does still provide a handful of worthwhile tracks and I'm sure the rest will find its audience, but for me, this was a letdown and I'm overall feeling a 5.5 out of 10. Next up from Spunkshine, a superposition of limitless states. Alright, Spunkshine. Hopefully we're no stranger to this guy in this channel. I've already reviewed his previous four albums. It's a Spunkshine album. I knew roughly what I was gonna get. He's he's easily comparable to Plaid, and basically how he relies on like the same sonic formula for every album, but that formula results in varied enough experiences, as well as varying the execution of said formula from album to album, that I'll still always end up interested in what he'll have up his sleeve this time around. Now, it may be true that I've been regularly doing videos on him, and he now happens to be into some stuff I miss segment, but not to worry, that doesn't mean this album was disappointing or anything. It was pretty good. I don't think I enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed his last one, We Will All Be Wrong Someday, but it is still as solid as I generally hope. And I think this project also got a bit quirkier on average than that one did. I felt like the tracks on this one had a lot more change-ups and detours. 
especially in the first half. I'm not going to do a lengthy breakdown of every track for the sake of keeping this segment on the shorter side, but I will mention some highlights. Uh, the opener, The Momentum of Protest, is an excellent attention grabber, starting out with blaring synth horns and switching off between various different grooves that range from jazzy to glitchy and somehow getting all of it to work together. Um... A random subatomic event that may or may not occur. I love the way he utilized all these various samples of violins and a yelling chorus and got it to go up against this badass movie soundtrack breakbeat. That one really stuck out every time. A humid unraveling, that took a while to get going. Uh, had a lengthy intro of moody pads, but about two minutes in it breaks into this much more mood brightening mix of guitars and pianos and the usual thumping beats. Uh, context Collapse, that has a lot of playful piano and synth rhythm, starts out rather old-timey sounding, as if it were an electro swing cut that was actually good, and then evolves into some bouncy lo-fi hip-hop with all these yelpy little vocal snippets, that one just puts a smile on my face. And I think the last cut here that I like, that I really liked was probably an unfocused blur, which did sort of take a while to kick in the gear, the first half of shifting pads and needed drum loops resembles any number of other Spongebob ambient cuts. But the second half, which has all these loops of choirs and pianos joining in on the mix, really pulled me in quite effectively. But aside from that, I mean, the album's second half is mostly unremarkable, with several ambient cuts that just resemble lots of other cuts in that style that he's done before over the years. Maybe Open the Box or Don't has some house pianos that are very garage bandish in texture, but also kind of giving me, like, Orbital Country Gvasser vibes. I don't know. There's nothing here that just had me, like, totally checked out entirely, though. And yeah, overall, the album's still pretty good, all things considered. Not his best. It might be in the lower half if I were to rank all of them, but it wouldn't be, like, way near the bottom either. Even if it kind of loses steam halfway, that entire first half had more than enough solid material to keep me invested. Good stuff as always, and it's even still free on Bandcamp if you like, so make sure to give it a shot if it passes you by. I'll give it a 7.3 out of 10. Next up, from Canopy, Refraction. Alright then, here we got a fresh name I'd never previously heard of, but given this project was released on the Upscale label, and got a fairly significant push from them, I figured this has got to be good. And while it didn't have nearly as much discussion material as I expected, given how dense other projects on the label like False Noises, Floral Strobe, or Hudson Lee's Headspaces have been, it was still a very solid project with some freaking incredible production as I'd hoped for out of someone releasing on this label. Ultimately, my biggest issue with it is that I can't really tell any of these tracks apart from each other. I feel like they all cycle through the same kinds of sounds. I don't have an in-depth breakdown in me on what really works to me about a track like Calstix or Flare or Strobe over another like Opalescence or Incandescence. The entire experience to me just basically blends together as a single 33 minute track. But not that there's anything wrong with that, especially when Canopy can certainly provide the sound design muscle that his peers on the label can, and still keep me invested by everything going on, certainly as fittingly colorful and fluid as all the various detached album artwork. Getting all these modern dubstep wubs going up against so many flashy kaleidoscopic synth washes, gorgeous airy ambience and skittering beats that range from irregular IDM patterns to bouncy house rhythms, it all adds up to such a monolithically huge and impressive sounding mix that towers over me, and like I'm watching all these colored lights bouncing and reflecting around in every direction. Even if my segments on this project is so much shorter than all the other ones here and doesn't go into much detail, absolutely do not let that turn you away from checking it out. There is a lot of really cool stuff to be heard here. This is promising stuff. I'll, I'll give it a 7.5 out of 10. Next up, from Andy Stott, Never the Right Time. Andy Stott is a British techno artist who's been around since the mid-2000s and I get requested to cover pretty frequently, mostly thanks to his 2012 album Luxury Problems that made quite a bit of headway among the Pitchfork crowd, among others. I don't often see a lot of discussion on his work outside of that project, which still gets regularly brought up, but I've known about him this long without having been interested enough to actually go through his stuff. So, of course, I made sure to do my due diligence and listen to all his previous studio albums. Here's my quick thoughts on those. Pretty decent if somewhat forgettable collection of ambient techno type stuff. Getting the same vibe off of this that I did listening to Alex Smoke. It's not bad. This is the one everyone talks about, much more of a turn towards darker and more experimental territory, but also introducing airy and occasionally borderline operatic vocals from Alison Skidmore. It's a nicely unsettling and unnerving listen, pretty unique execution too. 
probably still his best, though not the kind of thing I see myself putting on regularly. Like the last album, but with more sonic variety and genre experimentation, I guess. Not as consistent as the last one, unsurprisingly it wasn't huge on the really distortion heavy cuts on the second half, but I did really like the two synth pop leaning cuts in the title track and Science and Industry. The whole thing's still a pretty enjoyable and respectable listen all around. And uh, this one, I guess he doubled down on the poppier elements of his last album, though still retaining the same sort of mildly unnerving, otherworldly experimental atmosphere he created with his previous projects. It's okay, I guess. Though it just made me uh, want to listen to Magic 10 Tricks Point Ever instead. And this kind of returns to the same sorts of styles he explored on luxury problems, albeit without the vocals, and more dance friendly, I guess. Not nearly as emotionally investing as that project, but it's cool. I did like it more than too many voices. So yeah, um, Andy Stott sure is a thing. Kinda wish I had stronger feelings on any of his stuff in general. It was all pretty cool for what it was, but also very much mood music for me. I don't think he had any albums I would consider properly great, not even Luxury Problems itself. Even if they were all at least varying degrees of good. Can definitely see the appeal, and I get why people have been so enamored with his stuff. Guy is very good at atmosphere building for sure, and does have a uniquely heavy edge to his sound. It's just a shame that I now have to focus this segment on the guy's worst album by a considerable margin. And yeah, this isn't just gonna be like that Ochre project I talked about earlier. This That was just a standard run-of-mill ambient album by my ears that was perfectly serviceable for what it was. Never the Right Time is just not very good on a baseline level. It feels like Stott's production quality's taken a dip, and he's focusing on a much cheaper sounding sonic palette that I guess is trying to take some influence from indie pop or something? There are a few passable cuts, uh, the opener Away Not Gone and penultimate cut Dove Stone make for some alright brooding ambience, so I can't imagine either cut would be among my favorites on any other project of his. Hard to Tell is an interesting experiment for him, like this guitar-driven psych-pop sort of tune, though the guitars and synth watches he uses don't really blend as well as they could and still feels weirdly cheap sounding. And I did like that minute and a half piano interlude when it hits. Heck, its dramatic punchiness and brighter production probably made it stand out as my favorite cut here. There's a good sign for you that the interlude was the best part. But yeah, the rest of this project is just a chore to get through. Uh, the title track is like if you took a burial track and sucked out all the life out of it. Don't Know How is a similarly lifeless take on Jamie XX. Repetitive Strain sees him taking that, like, flute-sounding organ of the type that Nils Fromm used on parts of all melody and slapping it onto a crappy-sounding beat that doesn't match with it. And there's two tracks where the production g gets even significantly worse. Answers could have been a decent Outiker homage that resembles some cuts on Draft 7.30, my favorites, but all the brittle, shuffling, tinny drum textures totally swallow up the melodic synths and it sounds like ass. And the track at the beginning is just flat out awful. It sounds like some stock programmed beat that comes with an old Casio keyboard. The synths are like low rent com trues, the drums are weirdly echoed in this unflattering way, and Allison Skidmore acts as like a generic indie singer of the same variety that showed up on that last Tycho record. All her performances throughout this album sound totally bored and checked out, by the way. I mean, I suppose aside from those two tracks, the production isn't unlistenable or anything, just a, a step down from his previous stuff with some occasional cheap sounding parts. But it is really hard to excuse, given he's clearly proven himself to be capable of a lot better than this. And while this may still be recognizable as the work of Andy Stott, that's mainly by way of his always leaning towards brooding, pretentious dirges that are just no fun at all. He could make that super serious style work before, but whatever anxiety-ridden magic got luxury problems or faith in strangers to work as well as they did is just not present to nearly the same degree here. If you're still curious and were more into his other albums than I was, this might still provide you with some decent moments, but in general, I'd probably just recommend skipping over this one. I'm overall feeling a 4.5 out of 10. Next up, from Patricia Taxon, Daylight Spectrum. Okay, I'll freely admit I threw this in last minute to help break up the video. Patricia Taxon isn't the kind of artist I typically find suited to these kinds of roundups. If she has a notable filler release, I'd usually just bring it up in the prelude of my next proper dedicated video on her. But I did actually want to highlight this one real quick because it has hit for me in like a specific way that I feel like I haven't gotten out of a project from her in a really long time. I feel like ever since the best day in 2019, she's She's really started to trend away from making the kinds of, like, quick, lower-key, one-off, small-scale experiments into various genres. 
that sort of used to be your entire MO in all the previous years. So it was a refreshing surprise to get a project like Daylight Spectrum, which fulfilled that specific niche for me, that a project of hers hasn't since, like, telecommunications or nostalgia back in 2018. Just this kind of thing that I can put on in the background and not feel the need to think about too hard, and yet still actively makes me want to come back for more. And there is, like, a pretty obvious contrast between a project like this and Nostalgia since she's come so far as a producer and engineer in the past couple of years. Even if she's basically making, you know, lo-fi hip-hop beats to study to, the mixing and mastering is way more on point and well-balanced than her old stuff, as well as the actual melodies and chord progressions, they have more complexity and thought put into them, more in common with her triage ballet work. I will admit the lower stakes and simplicity of this project did sort of put me off when I first heard it back in February, and I, initially I was kind of ambivalent to it. But since I liked the idea of having this little project with each track correlating to a different time of day, I kept wanting to give it another chance, and it just grew on me more and more. I'd now call it one of her most consistently front-to-back enjoyable projects in some time. The run this project has from tracks 2 through 5 is one of my favorite four-track runs she's had in the wild, too. The breezy peppiness of Rudiments, going into the bright and cheerful chiptune of New Yorkers Walk Faster, going into the bouncy, low-key grooviness of Haircuts for Women, quite like the guitar glockenspiel combos on that one, and then Copenhagen Air just being my favorite cut here and hitting a more emotional note with its chord progression that sort of reminds me of her track Something Pretty in a few parts. And the other three tracks are all pretty good too. Uh, After Hours was the one that took the longest to click with me since I didn't think its more off-kilter groove came together as effectively as many of these other cuts, but it did end up working pretty well uh, yesterday when the skies were completely overcast and uh, it just kind of fit the mood. But yeah, not much else to say about this one. It's just a nice, low-stakes project from her that I didn't feel the need to think about too hard, but I got more mileage out of than I expected. If you missed it before, give it a shot. If you found it underwhelming before, maybe give it a revisit. I'll give it a 7.7 .7 out of 10. Next up, from you, Dreamland 2021. Sky is ah, you. Or Zoo, whatever you like. I have previously reviewed his last two albums, Generation Y and Ringo's Desert, but for those unfamiliar, he's a deep house artist and R&B singer with a fairly recognizable falsetto. It's kinda trying to be like The Weeknd, but not quite. Not gonna act like he's one of my all-time favorites or anything, I honestly wouldn't call him all that interesting in the bigger scheme of things. But he is still very popular, he can instantly get a new album to debut at number one on the iTunes dance charts. And this did mildly pique my curiosity, since it looked like this album was gonna mark a new change in sound for him. He was going cyberpunk! Getting a little more bass-heavy and synth-wave-y, I guess. In addition to the same airy Deep House stuff he's known for. And, uh, while the different aesthetic does make for a marginally more interesting listen than his last project, it's not by much. I mean, this is still basically just another Zhu album at the end of the day. The whole bassier cyberpunk sound is something that comes in at least partially in every track, but you can quickly forget that that's what the album's going for. A lot of these tracks just start out in the typical Zhu formulas, and then the harsher synth-wavy textures come back in and I'm like, oh right, cyberpunk. It's certainly more present in element than the desert theme of his last album, which was barely there at all. But it, you know, it's still not much more than window dressing. There were a handful of highlights. I thought Distant Lights was a cool demonstration of the new cyberpunk-ish sound and as a neat classic rock style intro. I liked Channel Trace's guest feature on How Does It Feel, even if it's not better than his appearance on The Last Disclosure thing. And Sky Is Crying is a legit pretty catchy track all around. Almost certainly the best track on here. But the whole thing does fall off in its second half. You get a track like Soko, which beats its meaningless title into the ground or yours, which is only memorable for this gem of a line, the more I give to you, the less I have. Yeah, that's, that's generally how that works. You also get tracks that I like parts of, but not the whole thing. I like Tanashi's parts of Only, but not Ju's parts where he gets needlessly covered in auto-tune. I like the whole acid breakdown at the end of Good For You, even if it follows an otherwise boring melodic trap cut. And Judeo 54 was almost a fun little darker house banger with its pitched down vocal hooks, but that little, like, mall announcer voice halfway through that tells everyone to get their ass on the dance floor, followed by Ju politely asking everyone to get down to his disco groove was pretty corny and took me out of it. 
I mean, this project's an inoffensive listen. I'm sure his usual fans will love it. Certainly not bad for what it is, and he did a better job of committing to his theme than last time. But, I mean, for the most part, he's kind of just reconfirming a lot of the same thoughts I've already expressed on him before, and if you're not already a fan, I can't say it's anything you need to go out of your way for. So, yeah, 6.3 out of 10. Next up, from Danny L. Harl, Harlcore. So You know, I'm not gonna act like I'm much of a fan of hyperpop or the whole PC music scene. Uh, that style has historically been a bit much for my tastes, and unless you're bringing something particularly creative to the table, I'm not gonna be that interested. I've mostly stayed away from reviewing projects in that mold since it's just not my bag. But I gotta say, despite this project coming from one of that label's founding members, this project really intrigued me right from the moment I first heard about it, because word on the street was that this was some kind of retro pastiche for the Eurodance era of all things. The whole thing is like a mix of sounds that I would have guessed came out no earlier than 1997 and no later than 2007, leaning a little more towards like early 2000s given the album cover. Influenced by the likes of the Initial D soundtrack, Max Covery is running in the 90s, Cascada's Every Time We Touch, Maybe a tiny hit of Eiffel 65 thrown in there for good measure. Harl separated the album into, like, tracks coming from four different personas he made up. Uh, there's DJ Danny, which created the most straightforward cuts of mid-2000s Cascada-style trance and late-90s DDR fodder. DJ Mayhem, I guess, made a slightly more abrasive mix of those sounds, which might have taken a few minor cues from the club boom of the late 2000s. Uh, DJ Ocean made wholly ambient variations on the sort of trans formulas in the vein of ATB. And of course, MC Boing is a pitched up yelping rapper specifically trying to evoke Crazy Frog. Just on a conceptual level, I love the idea behind this project. And if this is how the market for 2000s nostalgia is opening up, I'm, I'm on board for that. But of course, there was the question on how well this would play out in full album form. And while half of this project very much lives up to the hype set up by the aesthetic and concepts, I will have to admit that I did kind of get worn down by the sound and get a little sick of it as it went on. While listening to the first half, I was just hearing gem after gem, the nostalgia bombs of tracks like Where Are You Now and Do You Remember, and that same Eurodance style, but this time with Amen Breaks on On a Mountain, or this time with a squonking EDM-ish drop on Interlocked. The MC Boing tracks were hilarious, if also the kind of thing I could see getting really grating if I'm not in the right mood. The best of them having to be piano song, thanks to the those 90s house pianos getting pretty epic. But I did also have to smile at the random character breaking at the end of Car Song. Though by the second half of this thing, I was also starting to lose patience for it. The drop on All Night sounded a little, like, 2014 Big Room House-ish, albeit not as much of a buzzkill as the actual stuff from that era. Uh, Take My Heart Away just really got on my nerves in an unspecific sort of way, and For So Long did not have the same sense of atmosphere that Ocean's theme did, while also feeling like it ran on a bit long for its own good. Though the album did thankfully save itself at the end with one more solid cut in Ti Amo, which had one of the better tunes and stood out for having different vocals from the Eiffel 65-ish MC Spirits. I mean, while I was certainly excited to find out that this album exists, and I got pretty much exactly what I expected to get, this is the kind of thing where I've listened to it once, I feel like that's all I need. <laughs> it's a project that leans pretty much entirely on the novelty of how specific the era of nostalgia it's trying to evoke. And while it did succeed in what it set out to do, I didn't find the actual tunes and melodies to be memorable enough to make up for this project's non-stop crazy energy wearing thin by the end. Just like with any other happy hardcore type material, this is the kind of thing I need to be in a very specific mood to enjoy at best. So yeah, take that all as you will. I have no urge to listen to this again, but it did in fact make my day a little better when I did give it a shot, and if you've gotten a soldier for that era like I do, then it's at least worth the one listen as well. So I'll let this just barely get away with a solid 7. Next up from Katya Crow, I've called off the search, I know exactly where you are. Now for something completely different, here's a project I picked up after hearing about it through Spectrum Pulse's um, ambient episode, and it also been recommended a couple of times elsewhere. Been seeing a lot of acclaim from anyone who's actually heard of it, but not getting very much attention in general, so I threw it on here. And I can pretty much confirm that yes, this is a legit great ambient project. The mix of somewhat Tim Hecker-esque ambient passages with some occasional folksy acoustic guitar passages kinda reminded me of Haunted Disco, albeit with much more expansive production than hers. 
and the overall vibe reminded me of that Paint Scratcher album I covered in the last volume, without the harsh noise elements that were a minor turnoff there. And the resulting experience is the kind of which I could really see getting some solid replay value out of, and maybe slot in a similar space in my life that that, that uh, Biosphere Sender recordings did in 2019. I will admit uh, the more guitar-centric cuts on here, like the opener or After the Cold hit, tended not to hit as strongly as the more ambient-centric or drone-like cuts, but they do still have their own low-key melancholy charm to fit with everything else, and are hardly out of place. Also, when the cold hit turns those acoustic guitar sounds into something pretty intense and emotionally investing, when the guitars fall away entirely and get buried in a sea of nondescript echoing bassy noise around the 5 minute mark, it's one of my favorite moments on here. But it's the longer and more expansive pieces where this album really shows off its best material. The monolithic, borderline alien subspace created by everything I've seen needs rearranging. The Tim Hecker style blocky ambient interlude of I see your picture, it's in the same old frame. The glittering evolutions of the answers aren't the same when the questions keep on changing. Uh, that start out relatively dark and foreboding, but get more comforting as they go on. That one's excellent. The sorta two-parter title track with one half of fuzzy piano excursions bleeding into each other as if covered in infinite reverb, and the much lighter but strangely more haunting second half of blurry acoustic guitars. Maybe it runs on a tad long at 14 minutes, but it's not that distracting. But the album's penultimate cut has to be my favorite here. It's got this super chilling melodic progression of really toned down synth pads that feels like a mix between Aphex Twin's Matchsticks and Rhubarb. It feels like with the effect of that track alone, the temperature of whatever room I'm in lowers by like 10 degrees. And of course, the bassy, subtle building distortion of the final cut, You Are Dead, suitably ends the album in the darkest way it could. But as dark and emotionally intense as this album gets, it never got like that William Basinski record I covered in the last volume, where it was like so emotionally devastating to the point of actively getting hard to listen to. This album is just as great at setting its dark, empty, melancholy mood, but it never got to be so dark to the point of cutting into the listenability like the opera sampling pieces on Lamentations did. Yes, even with you, the listener, symbolically watching your own death at the end of this thing. My years of being a Submachine fan might have softened the blow in that one. But in a good way. That just means this project has a much higher chance of getting more replay value for me as the year goes on. Not much else to say. This is really freaking solid across the board. Really deserves to get more attention. I'll give it a solid 8 out of 10. Next up, from Floating Points, Pharaoh Sanders, and the London Symphony Orchestra, Promises. Alright, now here's one that I've been getting a lot of requests to cover. I have previously covered one of the three names attached to this project. Back in 2019, I've covered Floating Point's last album, Crush, and also briefly talked about being a fan of his debut, Elania, and how it melded electronic and jazz music in a really cool way. Not that it's difficult to impress me by combining an electronic and jazz in any way. But this time, Floating Point is up the ante by not only working with legendary saxophonist Pharaoh Sanders, but even working with the London Symphony Orchestra. I talk about loving projects that bridge the gap between electronic and jazz, or electronic and orchestral all the time, and now here's one that does all three and seamlessly works them together. Must be the greatest album of all time now, obviously. Okay, there's one more thing to mention. This project isn't like some wild and crazy amalgamation of these genres that makes for this super mind-blowing experience. It's really more of an ambient project at its core. There are nine movements to the piece, but it's really best treated as one single 47-minute track. With the same very low-key, like, seven-note broken keyboard and bell chords playing every few seconds, being joined by plenty of other instrumentation coming and going over time, be it Sanders' saxophone, his wordless vocalizing on part four, the orchestra building up and swelling, etc. Et There's not even all that much synths on it. D those don't really join in the mix in a particularly notable way until part seven, where all these various cascades of bleeping arpeggios slowly build up and overtake the mix and maybe a bit in the background of part three. It doesn't feel like any one of the three names attached to the project is any more important or takes any more precedence over another, even if Floating Points is the one helming the whole project. This project would barely qualify as electronic otherwise. But yeah, I mean, the actual listening experience is roughly as good as it probably sounds to you on paper. I don't think I got a nine out of 10 experience out of this like Fantano did, but it was all around excellent. 
hit that same sort of note for me that the end of Underworld's Appleshine Continuum does. Just kind of free-flowing and emotionally stirring, slow-moving, but not slow-progressing. Maybe not every movement is as riveting as the next. Part 6 and 7 are easily the best ones, and where most of my enjoyment lies. And Part 9 sort of feels like a tacked on hidden track. I wish it had been, like, put at closer proximity to Part 8. But I mean, there's not really much to critique about a project like this. It, it pretty much lived up to the hype, not much else to say. I'll give it a uh, 8.5 out of 10. And finally, Reed Willis, Mother of. And now, time for the last segment. This is a project from the end of 2020 that I missed. I guess these roundups are starting to develop a tradition of finishing on, like, big, supersonically dense and complex projects. So now we've got Reed Willis, a label made of Rob Clouth, who actually emailed me, like, two, three months ago, recommending I check out his oh, first album here. I mean, a lot of people email me their music. But given his proximity to this other artist who just instantly blew me away when I checked him out near the end of the last year, I figured, hey, he looks like the kind of thing I'd like. I don't really see many people talking about him. I'll give him a shot. And for what it's worth, he doesn't actually sound that much like Rob Clough. Maybe some similar IDM percussion patterns, and both of them utilize piano compositions in their mixes. But the vibe I get out of this project is totally different. There's a lot more of like a darker, more unpredictable experimental edge and orchestral bombast to Reed Willis's stuff. He comes much closer to Elon Moore, if maybe not as crazy out of the box creative with the sound design. I also hear some similarities to Amon Tobin's recent work, especially on this album's opener. Got some fear and a handful of dust in Long Stories vibes with some of these instrumental choices, and I will not complain in that department. Now, I will have to admit another thing he has in common with Elon Moore is that this was not an immediate listen. Uh, it was much more cerebral. It required me to give it multiple full attention listens in order for me to even pin down how I felt. This was not a project that I just absolutely loved immediately, and even now I wouldn't say it's one of my, like, new big favorite projects in this sort of style. It's great, and every track can at least lean on its sound design and its emotional core. I don't get the feeling this project is trying that hard to be impressive for its own sake as some projects in this style do, but it's definitely got its issues. Mainly with pacing and cohesion, like this isn't like a zero point where every track just seamlessly links into the next and makes for one giant holistic experience. Mother Of is more of a collection of similar sounding tracks that sometimes sort of segue into each other but not that much. And not every cut is as riveting as the next. A few parts of this end up feeling like I'm listening to some anonymous film soundtrack or something. Tracks like The Ocean Won't Allow and Helix Flex just kind of meander wherever they like without any defined structure or direction. And while again they do have impressive sound design, as with everything else, they mainly make me feel like we've kind of lost the plot and aren't progressing. They're like a bunch of unrelated sounds stitched together. The former of those two cuts did grow on me, though. Ocean Won't Allow is pretty good. There's maybe a redundant track like Leadcast, which, while it doesn't feel as structuralist, didn't feel like it added anything that other tracks on here couldn't already. And I also didn't think the shorter ambient interludes added much to the experience either. Tracks like Slow Sympathy, The Great Blank, and to a lesser extent the title track. It just feels like we're taking breaks and momentarily halting the album's momentum. They feel more like filler than particularly important moments in their own right. But as many issues as I have with the albums, the kind of awkward pacing and tendencies to meander aimlessly, there's still no denying that when it hits, it really hits. And there are more hits than misses here. I already mentioned the Amon Tobin-esque opener, She Dreamt Her Hands Were Constellations, that's an excellent tone setter and attention grabber. And it keeps me invested with the abrasive banger that is fingered to pulse. The shouting preacher-like voices on that one are a great touch. As well as the lower key orchestral soundscape of Crying Particles. These first three tracks make for an excellent start to the project. The almost more heartwarming expansiveness of tracks like Memory Ribbons and She Planted Stars at Her Feet make for some of the most potent emotional moments on this thing, and some of the better melodies to boot. The Separator, meanwhile, despite also feeling kind of structureless and like a bunch of seemingly random sections that can sometimes feel jarringly cut together, still somehow feels like it has build-ups and payoffs that make sense to me. That track is legit epic, and that out of nowhere banging drum solo near the end was awesome. And of course the closer, A Home in the Void, makes for a fittingly emotional, climactic, and well-structured finish to this thing that also sort of mirrors the opener in a cool way, I guess? I mean, I may complain about this album's weaker points, but unlike a project where, like a Frequent Stream Recall, where the weaknesses are sticking with me more than the strengths and causing the album to shrink on me, 
This album's higher points did leave much more of an impact than the weaker moments. And even some of the weaker ones started to bother me less the more I listened to it. Even if this album definitely would have been a bit stronger with some tightening up, I don't feel as strongly compelled to mess with the track listing. So take that all as you will. I'm not sure if this would have been a year-end list contender for last year given the sheer amount of great electronic projects that came out in 2020, but maybe it could have been a 20th honorable mention or something, I don't know. It's still a really impressive work and definitely worth checking out for anyone willing to plunge its dark, experimental, but often emotionally charged depths. And I'm overall feeling a solid 8 out of 10 on it. And that's it. That's the roundup. We're, we're stopping there. Uh, but of course, this is just my opinion. You can feel free to disagree with it, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. So leave the comments in the comment thing down there. Shout out to my Patreon supporters. They're awesome people. You want to add yourself to that list or make me review something, link to my Patreon is in the description. But yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all for today. See you next time.